Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with a lecture for a &P 2 on the immune system. In the first part of the lecture, I'm going to introduce two terms related to the immune system called resistance and immunity. And in the second part, we'll look at um, specific resistance or innate defense mechanisms. Now recall that the immune system isn't an organ system. It's a set of cells and chemicals that help us um, defend ourselves against infectious agents. And so we're going to be looking at how the body protects us from these various disease causing agents like Staphylococcus aureus shown in the upper left, E. coli, um, tumors even, and yeast infections shown on the bottom right, um, giardia, a pretty bad gastrointestinal um, pathogen, prion diseases like um, CWD, mad cow disease, and just the typical adenovirus. So let's start with comparing what is the difference between resistance and immunity. We do have these two arms of protection. The first we're born with, so we call them innate mechanisms. Resistance mechanisms are innate. You're born with these protections. They act quickly. And they're not adap adaptive in any way. There's no learning that takes place. They just exist the way they are. They don't change. Um, and they're nonspecific. That means that they, they perform the same function no matter which pathogen it is, or at least um, multiple pathogens. And so without being adaptive or the ability to change, no learning, there's no memory that takes place. That means with, with repeated exposures, the exact same resistant me resistance mechanism will take place. That's very different from immunity. Immunity is acquired. Now there is a genetic component. We are born with genes that um, code for specific antibodies and specific types of T cells. These are lymphocytes, types of lymphocytes. But those genes can be rearranged with exposure. So protection is largely created in response to exposure. And the ability to recognize different antigens will differ between different individuals based on um, what they've been exposed to as well as their genetic component or whatever their genes dictate. Immunity acts slower with the first exposure, but it's adaptive. That means learning takes place. Exposure teaches our cells to um, respond quicker with subsequent exposures. So this means that memory is created. Repeated exposure results in enhanced protective ability because it fights off the pathogen quicker. Immunity is also specific. And what that means is that there's going to be a different subset of white blood cells and chemical compounds that are used for each pathogen. Different ones for each pathogen. Here's some examples of nonspecific resistance versus specific immunity. In nonspecific resistance, the skin is a barrier. That doesn't change. It's always a barrier. You're born with it, so it's innate. And the, the skin has the same cells and chemicals and mechanisms to fight more than one infectious agent. For example, in this picture, we've got some um, bacteria that are rod-shaped and some that are more spherical. So two different infectious agents, the skin will act exactly the same in preventing infection. But with specific immunity, 
there's going to be a unique set of cells in our lymphatic system, uh, in the bloodstream, and in our extracellular or, or in our peripheral tissues and chemical compounds as well that will be used to fight each one of these agents. So a unique subset for the rod bacteria and a different subset, subset of cells and chemicals for the spherical shape. So an example of this might be that um, you have one kind of lymphocyte. Now you have many of these, but one type of lymphocyte makes a certain antibody that uh, fights against, um, we'll say, typhoid. And a different kind of a lymphocyte that fights against, um, I guess, a virus, right? So different subsets. Now we usually think of resistance and immunity in these um, in this way, and that is that we have three lines of defense guarding us against infection. The first two lines are part of this resistance that's nonspecific and that you're born with. The, the third line of defense involves true immunity, and that's acquired with exposure. Sometimes you're born with it, but generally it's modified based on exposure. So with resistance, the first line of defense involves barriers, physical barriers, chemical barriers at the body surface. The second line of defense is if the pathogen is utilized, if the pathogen has broken through those barriers. And now the second line of defense will include certain leukocytes, that will attack the pathogen or proteins. Inflammation is a, a resistance mechanism and so is fever. In immunity, the third line of defense, we have two branches. Either, well, it could be a, combina a combination of both of these could be used simultaneously. But one branch of immunity involves lymphocytes called T lymphocytes. And another branch of immunity involves lymphocytes called B lymphocytes. These are the ones that make antibodies. So we refer to these two branches as cell mediated immunity. That's the one that involves T lymphocytes and antibody mediated immunity. That's the one that involves B lymphocytes. And of course, there is a relationship between these. There's nonspecific resistance mechanisms that overlap with the mechanisms used by specific immunity involving antibodies, as well as the fact that certain cells that are involved in cell-mediated immunity will help antibody-mediated immunity. And there's crossover in between. One thing that's really interesting um, at this point to talk about is the fact that HIV, uh, the hum human immunodeficiency virus that is just so deadly, although now we have treatments for it, but what makes that virus so devastating is that it targets or infects the cells that lie at the center of all three of these. So there are certain cells called T helper cells that influence nonspecific resistance, influence cell mediated immunity and antibody Im mediated immunity. And these cells help amplify all three of those branches of defense. And if those cells are knocked out by a virus, then these branches become weaker. And we'll talk about that at the end, but that's what HIV does. That's so terrible. So in the rest of this lecture, we're just going to talk about resistance or nonspecific defense. And, you know, with COVID just happening, we're used to the concept of barriers, right? So um, a face mask was a barrier against, um, uh, I can't think of it viruses transmitted in the air and we're also familiar with the concept of washing our hands so that we don't spread pathogens.
So those are two examples of resistance mechanisms. Let's look at the physical barriers that exist in our bodies to provide this first line of defense. First, the skin. There's keratin protein at the surface of our skin, which is hard for um, certain pathogens to penetrate. In, in addition, we exfoliate um, our outer skin cells and make new ones all the time. Another physical barrier would be hair at the external openings like our nostrils that can trap pathogens so we don't inhale them or they don't enter our bodies. We also have mucous membranes, um, mucus production in all of our external openings and sometimes there's even cilia associated with those membranes that help trap um, microbes. We also produce fluids and secretions that flush or dilute pathogens. Urine is an example, saliva is an example, um, hydrochloric acid in the stomach is an example. Those are physical barriers, but I guess you could also call them chemical barriers, but they're physical in the sense that they flush out a pathogen or dilute the concentration of a pathogen. And then blood clots become a physical barrier. If we have um, a wound in a blood vessel, a clot is formed so that no pathogens can get into the blood. And that would be true of platelet plugs as well, but we know the blood clots with the fibrin are actually stronger. Okay, let's look at the first lines of defense that involve chemical barriers now. So acid always inhibits bacterial growth and our skin and vaginal openings and vagina have what we call an acid mantle. That means that there's some acid produced. It's not extreme like hydrochloric acid in the stomach, which also inhibits bacterial growth, but there's a slight acidity to our skin and our vagina. Also on our skin is a chemical that's released called dermocidin, and it inhibits bacterial growth. Um, it's actually secreted with our sweat and um, kind of coats our skin. In addition, we have lysozyme that destroys bacteria. It breaks apart their cell walls and cell membranes, cell wall in particular, sorry. And um, that lysozyme is present in saliva, in most mucus, and in lacrimal, lacrimal fluid, our tears. We also have a set of proteins called defensins that are produced by mucous membranes, and they control both bacterial and fungal growth. So we have quite a few chemical barriers. So that's the first line of defense. If the pathogen gets across the physical barriers and the all present chemical barriers, the ones that are always there, and reaches the interior of our body, then the second line of defense um, is called upon. And these involve the white blood cells and any chemicals that they release. So the white blood cells that we've learned about are neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, which turn into macrophages in the blood, and basophils, as well as natural killer lymphocytes. Now, not all pathogens cross the physical barrier and get directly into the blood where we find these white blood cells. So the white blood cells can leave the blood through a process called extravasation. And when they leave the white blood cell and go to a point of infection, they do so by a process called chemotaxis. They follow a chemical gradient that's either emitted by the tissue that's been damaged or by the pathogen itself. So leukocytes are not confined to the blood in the case of fighting infection. Let's look at each one of these cell types and what they can do for us.
First, neutrophils can perform phagocytosis, particularly of bacteria. So that means they'll engulf bacteria, break them down, so they can no longer cause mayhem. But these neutrophils, uh, when activated by the presence of a bacteria, also release these agents called bacteria, bactericidal agents that uh, is known as a respiratory burst. And in this picture on the right, we're seeing a neutrophil releasing all these um, bactericidal agents and a killing zone. So this particular neutrophil and this one, they have both released lysozyme oxidizing agents like hydrogen peroxide. And so those chemicals will kill anything in the pathway of that uh, chemical release or respiratory burst. Okay, eosinophils are also able to perform phagocytosis, but not of an entire cell. Instead, antigen antibody complexes are what they um, can engulf. So some antibodies are released and float in our bloodstream. And when they find an antigen and bind to it, they're not necessarily attached to a cell, these antibodies. And so an eosinophil can engulf it. In addition, eosinophils release antiparasitic chemicals like hydrogen peroxide and neurotoxin. And they respond to allergens by stimulating basophils to release histamine. Because of this action, they can often amplify hypersensitivity reactions. So they have an important role in inflammation and hypersensitivities or allergens. Okay, let's look at monocytes. Monocytes, when they migrate into tissues, are now called macrophages. I'm not 100% sure why we have to change the name. I suppose monocytes don't really do phagocytosis. That might be why. I don't know. But macrophages can um, engulf cells, dead cells, debris, antigen antibody complexes, any cells that have been tagged by antibodies. So let's say we've got a bacteria, it's supposed to be a rod-shaped E. coli bacteria, that an antibody has recognized. The antibody will then bind to it, which basically just tags it for destruction. And now the macrophage will recognize this antibody bound to this cell and engulf it. So in addition, macrophages can engulf any host cells that display foreign molecules on their surface. So all of our cells in our body have a certain uh, number or types of proteins on the surface. And if they have engulfed um, something dangerous or pathogenic, it might get processed, whatever that pathogen was. I'll just make a pathogen here. Let's say the pathogen gets inside the cell. The cell will break up that pathogen and then display parts of the pathogen out on the surface of its cell. Macrophages can recognize the fact, certain macrophages can recognize the fact that what's on the surface of that cell is not normal. And so the macrophage can tag it and it'll actually be destroyed a little bit later. Macrophages <clears throat> present um, certain antigens to some more harmful white blood cells called T lymphocytes. So they will activate the adaptive immune response as well. And we'll talk about that in a lot more detail as we progress. For now, macrophages can phagocytize just about anything. So the process of a macrophage <clears throat> identifying 
an antibody coated pathogen or foreign cell as shown in the top of this picture. The antibodies are red. The foreign cell is like orange. The fact that or the process by which the macrophage recognizes those antibodies um, is due to the coating of the foreign cell and that process is called opsonization. So opsonization helps macrophages perform phagocytosis. Opsonization is the coating with the antibodies. Here's an example of a macrophage that's engulfing a host cell that's displaying a, a foreign molecule, something that's not innate to our body. So here's the host cell on the upper left with the nucleus and the DNA. Let's say a virus infects that cell. One of the things about viruses that's so harmful is that they release either RNA or DNA usually RNA, into the cell. And now that can, um, that viral DNA can be used to make more viral particles. The DNA codes for viral particles. And then the, some of the viral particles will be released, but some of the viral particles will be displayed on the surface of the host cell. And so these viral antigens will um, be detected by a macrophage, and the macrophage can engulf the entire infected cell. Now there are different host cells that display these foreign antigens in different ways. And we're going to talk about which cells do what. But first, I need to describe to you the fact that our cells have these proteins, or they're glycoproteins, actually, um, on all of our cells. And the protein or glycoprotein is called MHC. That stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex. So these glycoproteins are unique to each person, determined by our genes. And we have two different types of MHCs on all of our, well, not all of our cells. We have this type called MHC class 1 on all of our nucleated cells. So that means not erythrocytes, because remember, they don't have a nucleus. And then we have MHC class 2, which is on, only on special antigen-presenting cells. These would be cells in the thymus that help mature T lymphocytes, macrophages, which do all that fabulous phagocytosis, B cells that make antibodies, and dendritic cells in, cells in our skin that can perform phagocytosis as well. So these cells that have MHC class 2 will have both MHC class 1 and MHC class 2. And these cells that have both are called antigen-presenting cells. And the antigen is going to sit right in this little location on the surface of that glycoprotein. MHC class 1 glycoproteins also display antigens right here. But the class 2 combination with the antigen um, will only be recognized by this specific subset of cells in your body, B cells, macrophages, thymus cells, etc. Not a plain old neutrophil, not a plain old eosinophil, okay? So let me give you an example about how uh, antigens are displayed um, on our host cells or our cells. So let's take first MHC1, cells that have MHC1 all over their surface. The MHC1 is shown as a yellow molecule down in the lower right. And remember, this is your body cell. 
And all the time in your body, you know, you're making proteins and particles inside the cells that are going to get processed through the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi and complexed with this MHC1 that then is displayed on the surface. And this is all normal. This isn't necessarily pathogenic. So you have a set of MHC1 cla class 1 molecules bound to your self antigens. And your immune system learns to recognize your self antigens. But in other cases, an exogenous antigen, an antigen that results from the fact that there was some sort of an infectious agent, results in the breakdown of that infectious agent and processing. But now the processing is going to occur in association with an MHC2 glycoprotein. And so now on the surface of the cell, we have a foreign antigen, which is kind of what exogenous means, complexed on an MHC class 2 um, glycoprotein. This is what is not normal, meaning uh, the immune system will recognize it as being a foreign combination of molecules. And so this is what the macrophages, the B lymphocytes, the dendritic cells, and those thymus cells will recognize. They will recognize this and learn to uh, note that it is foreign and we need to control the cell because it's been infected. They will also recognize that the self antigens are normal. but it's the MHC2 with the foreign antigen that triggers a response by the immune system. Okay, so that all involves macrophages. Now let's talk about basophils. Basophils are called such in the blood, but when they extravasate into tissues, they're called mast cells. Again, I'm not exactly sure why there's a different name, but um, these mast cells look similar to basophils. You'll see those dark staining granules. And they have a central role in inflammation, you know, because they release histamine, which is a vasodilator. That helps more leukocytes get out of the blood and fluid release from the blood. But they also release heparin, which is an anticoagulant so that blood clots won't form. And um, the degranulation or the release also involves cytokines. And these cytokines, that's just a generic term for a chemical that attracts other white blood cells. So when a basophil or a mast cell degranulates, it releases the ones we've already heard about, histamine and heparin but also cytokines that attract neutrophils, eosinophils, and macrophages to the site where they are. They'll f the neutrophils, eosinophils, and macrophages will follow the cytokine gradient right up to the basophil and hopefully do their job once they get there, like the respiratory burst by neutrophils like engulfing antigen antibody complexes by eosinophils and macrophages that can engulf just about anything. Another type of cell that's considered to be involved in resistance versus immunity is a lymphocyte. It's called a natural killer cell. And it performs immune surveillance floating throughout the lymphatic system and the bloodstream, destroying any foreign cells, including bacteria or transplanted cells. So these are the ones that you try to neutralize uh, when there's a transplant um, of an organ or something. 
They function by destroying any cell that's abnormal or different. This includes viral infected cells, cancer cells, in addition to foreign, uh, like transplanted cells. The way they work is by releasing perforins, which form this pore in the foreign cell. And then they release a chemical called a granzymes. And those chemicals go through the pore into the enemy cell or the cancer cell or the virally infected cell and cause it to undergo apoptosis. And apoptosis is defined as a programmed process of cell death. It's just cell death, but it's not just because the cell is decaying. It's an actual programmed process where like the DNA is shut down, different organelles are shut down in a certain order. Then the macrophages have to come in and clean up the debris. As always, they're the workhorses. Okay, we also have a set of proteins. Um, we just got done with cells, but we now have a set of proteins in the second line of defense. Um, one is a group of proteins called interferons, and another is a set of proteins called complement. So interferons are cytokines secreted by cells that have been infected, our body cells that have been infected. And these interferons prevent viral infection in neighboring cells. They also activate natural killer cells. So the natural killer cells can come along and induce apoptosis in the virally infected cells. So before I talk about complement, let's just look at how interferon works. So this is um, a host cell in blue and a virus infects the cell and um, takes over the cell's machinery to produce more viral particles that normally are released by the host cell and then go on to affect na infect neighboring cells. But interferons are produced in infected cells we have genes in the nucleus that are interferon genes and that codes for interferon and the interferon is released and travels to a neighboring cell which binds to a receptor on the nearby cell here, the neighboring cell, and signals that cell to make antiviral proteins. So those proteins might prevent infection completely or it, those proteins might prevent the virus from being replicated. So this cell will probably not be destroyed. Incidentally, the virally infected cell that's on the left, when it releases all those viruses that have been produced, here using the cell's own machinery, it pretty much destroys the host cell. But before it dies, it releases all of these interferons that interfere with viral replication in the neighboring cell. Okay, the second set of proteins in our second line of defense are um, are a group of 20 plasma proteins in the blood called complement. And complement can act directly to break apart target cells. We call that cytolysis or cytolysis. So complement can actually perforate target cells and cause them to break apart. Complement can also promote phagocytosis by things like neutrophils and macrophages and enhance inflammation. So let's look at these 20 plasma proteins roughly, not in great detail, but somewhat, and talk about 
what they are. Complement consists of 20 zymogens. Now that means they're inactive, which is good because you wouldn't want complement activated all the time, just like you don't want coagulation factors to be activated all the time. They're made by the liver and they have certain names. C1 through C9 factors B, D, and P, and then some regulatory ones. Don't worry about it. There's 20 of them. They're zymogens. They become activated through a cascade of chemical reactions, just like the clotting factors become activated. And we'll look at how they're activated in a second. I think their actions are probably just as important. So one thing they can do is they can coat foreign antigens and cells, like antibodies do. So that process is called opsonization, because it's coating a foreign antigen to be recognized. <clears throat> they can, these 20 zymogens can, when they're activated, stimulate basophils to release their granular contents, histamine, heparin, etc., which enhances inflammation and, of course, attracts other leukocytes. And then finally, complement can do something a little bit like the natural killer cells do, and that is induce cytolysis of foreign cells or abnormal host cells. So let's look at next before because I'll go through examples of each of these three actions but let's first look at how these complement zymogens are activated there are three different ways that complement zymogens can be activated and they are activated in a certain order as well so the three pathways are classical lectin and alternate alternative I'm never going to ask you that, but there's three ways. In all cases, the first one that's activated is C3. And C3 gets broken apart into C3B and C3A. They already have a role. One is that C3B can do opsonization or coating so that phagocytosis will be easier for the macrophages. C3A, are, that's the one that will actually activate the basophils and enhance inflammation. But in addition, C3B will start the whole, co the whole uh, cascade of activation and all the complement zymogens will form this chain of proteins, we'll call it, shown here and form what's known as a, a MAC attack complex. Pretty funny, MAC attack. That doesn't mean a big MAC attack. Okay, so how do these work? The classical pathway is that uh, first, this pathogen arrives in your body. Antibodies bind to the pathogen. The complement, zymogen, C3, will recognize the antibody pathogen complex. And that starts the whole process. That's the classical way. I think that's because that's how it was discovered. The lectin pathway is that many foreign cells have these proteins called lectins. And complement binds to that. So it's like tagging a foreign cell. Not much different than tagging a foreign cell with antibodies. This one just doesn't have antibodies. An alternative pathway is that the zymogens or the complement proteins and factors just spontaneously find, all find their way to the surface of the microorganism and spontaneously assemble. So there's a lot more detail to all of that. I think what's most important is to know that there are multiple ways that complement can be activated. One way involves an antibody binding to a pathogen. Now the actions, 
include, there were three actions, opsonization, which is just coating a microorganism to aid a macrophage in doing phagocytosis because macrophages are going to have a receptor for that complement protein that binds to the foreign uh, coated cell. So that's one thing that complement does. The second thing that complement does is enhance inflammation. And that's because when C3A is formed and then C5A eventually is formed, together they are going to cause histamine release by basophils and increased blood vessel permeability. And so that's going to enhance inflammation and attract white blood cells, particularly phagocytes, to the site of infection. The last one is really unique. Well, it's a little bit like perforins and gramzymes, but it's different proteins. So complement, when it assembles in this structure, all the zymogens kind of bind together. Um, this membrane attack complex is what it's really called. Inserts into a target cell membrane. It might be a bacterial cell. It might be an infected host cell. But when multiple max insert, it forms this pore. And because there's a pore, fluid leaves the target cell, comes out. And um, the target cell will burst eventually. Or in some cases, because inflammation has been increased, the target cell is going to fill with fluid and that will cause the target cell to swell and burst. Either way, it's dead. It's got a hole in it. Okay, the last line or the last set of mechanisms involved with the second line of defense are inflammation and fever. And these are processes versus just one set of cells or one kind of protein. So we'll do inflammation first. Inflammation is caused by the injury of tissue, a variety of causes, physical trauma, heat, irritating chemicals, infection. And we usually recognize inflammation because the site will have redness, which is known as ruber, swelling, which is ru we call edema most of the time, heat, which is sometimes called calor, and pain is called dolor. And I think you're probably already aware of this, but when a region of your body is inflamed, um, we use this suffix uh, ITIS. Like in um, kidney disease, we might say um, nephritis for the nephrons. Okay, so inflammation. What are the functions of inflammation? Well, the first function is to confine the pathogen so that it doesn't spread. We're going to look at how that happens. The second function is to destroy the pathogen, kill it. And then that always involves cleaning up debris, molecules and chemicals and stuff, the broken up pieces. And then it's important to repair the damaged tissue either by stem cells dividing or forming a clot or whatever. And then finally, inflammation can alert the adaptive immune system, which we won't go into in great detail here. So these are the steps of the inflammatory, inflammatory response. The injured tissue or cells release certain chemicals that cause vasodilation or attract phagocytes or white blood cells. One such chemical is prostaglandins. There's different types, chemokines and cytokines. So all three of these are going to um, activate mast cells in the tissue. 
And remember that mast cells are really basophils in the tissue. And so the second step involves histamine release, which causes vasodilation. And now the white blood cells can respond to these chemokines and cytokines. They have a way to get out of the blood and follow the gradient of um, the chemokines. So in addition, the vasodilation um, leaks plasma and complement proteins from our blood vessels. And so that's why we get swelling and heat because the plasma is warm. So that's the first step. The second step is to destroy um, the pathogen. And the phagocytes appear at the damage site, usually neutrophils first, and then the macrophages. And because the complement has been activated, um, by, uh, by being simply released from the blood with the plasma, the complement will opsonize the pathogen. And that, of course, will cause more phagocytes and more basophils to come to the site. So I just want to step back for a second and look at the uh, confining process. So one function of inf inflammation was to confine the pathogen. And I, I didn't really discuss that in full detail. So how is the pathogen uh, confined? It has to do with the proteins that are leaked from the blood vessels and um, the inundation of white blood cells and red blood cells from the blood. It kind of makes a wall. And, and we're going to look at a picture so that that makes more sense to you in just a second. OK, so the last two steps involve repairing tissue and then alerting the adaptive immune system. Well, if the inflammation involved a blood vessel, which it often does, uh, clotting will happen. If it, uh, the lymphatic vessels are able to drain the swelling, the plasma that leaked, and resident fibroblasts repair the tissue. So we often have these cells in um, connective tissues called fibroblasts that make um, all those thick and thin filaments that we've seen. Um, and they usually start the tissue repair process even before stem cells begin multiplying. And of course, the macrophages, dendritic cells, um, they can engulf the antigens. Now, once they engulf the antigens, they can display a part of the antigen on the cell surface by that MHC2 molecule. So the antigen will be out here, and the MHC2 is what's displaying it. This enables specific lymphocytes to recognize the foreign antigen, and that will create memory eventually. So it, and it um, tells the immune system that exposure has occurred. So let's look at a picture of the inflammatory response, because I think it makes more sense to look at a picture. So first we have damaged tissue, a splinter, say, and bacteria came in with that. The response to just damaged tissue alone causes inflammatory chemicals to be released by the tissue. These inflammatory chemicals attract white blood cells. So the white blood cells have to first roll along the surface. Here we call this margination. 
and then they have to escape. That's called extravasation or diapedesis, which means to use foot processes to get out of the white blood cell. And now they're attracted to these inflammatory chemicals. Now, the increased permeability of the red of the blood vessel happened because some of these inflammatory chemicals in uh, affected mast cells that live close to this tissue. And those mast cells released heparin and made the pores between cells bigger. So now the white blood cells can get out and they're attracted to these inflammatory chemicals and they can perform phagocytosis at the site of injury where most of the bacteria are. Now the fluid that leaks out, the plasma that leaks out, actually forms this kind of wall around the bacteria, kind of suspending the bacteria there. And as repair processes happen, fibrin is laid, laid down um, by the fibroblasts, and so the bacteria are kind of walled off. I have a number of um, animations of the process of inflammation for you to watch. And these are the links, and I just wanted to tell you in this lecture that I'm going to post these links uh, concerning the inflammatory response. Okay, the last little bit of our second line of defense is fever. And fever is defined as an abnormal elevation in your body temperature. It can also be called pyrexia or a febrile attack. There's a lot of different causes. We're mainly dealing with infection in, in this particular lecture. Um, and the reason that your blood, uh, your body temperature goes up is due to chemicals called pyrogens that affect the hypothalamus, which is where your temperature set point is determined. So pyrogens will increase that temperature set point. And so things like um, thyroid hormone increasing the metabolic rate in general will, will just increase your body temperature. Now there's different kinds of pyrogens though. You can have a pyrogen that's released by the infectious agent, like the bacteria or virus that invaded the body. It actually releases pyrogens. Those are called exogenous pyrogens. But also, when our body goes through an inflammatory response, those other uh, first and second lines of defense, our cells, our body cells, particularly neutrophils and macrophages, release pyrogens. But they're only going to do so when they've been exposed to a foreign pathogen of some sort. But since our own cells are releasing these pyrogens, they're called endogenous pyrogens. Regardless, the pyrogens affect the hypothalamus and they make your set point higher, your temperature. So having a higher temperature set point makes a person feel cold at your normal 98.6 degree Fahrenheit temperature. So if you feel cold, what do you do? You shiver that generates heat because your muscles are contraction contracting and that will eventually increase your body temperature. But after the infection has been eradicated or defeated, then there should be no more pyrogen secretion and your set point should return to normal. It really should. Both aspirin and ibuprofen actually um, inhibit pyrogens. So that helps um, decrease fever. So why has your body um, developed or evolved um, this mechanism of fever? Well, first, there's, there's quite a few benefits. The first benefit is that your cells at a higher temperature are going to increase their metabolic rate. That probably means they're going to do repair processes quicker or maybe divide quicker. But one thing that's interesting is that fever inhibits particularly bacteria reproduction. 
So they won't go through their process of binary fission or cell division as quickly. Also, heat promotes the release of interferons, which helps protect nearby cells from getting infected. And it aids in the function of T lymphocytes and other white blood cells. So up to a certain elevated set point, fever has some advantages. But you know, if it gets too high, this metabolic rate of your, of your, your host cells um, <clears throat> can actually inhibit their ability to function normal. So when you're talking about a fever of 105 degrees, it can really affect um, conscious, not consciousness, whether you're alert or not, but you might become a little del delirious because there's some cellular dysfunction. But at 111 to 115 degrees, it can result in permanent brain damage. So that's really bad, right? So there's initially some be benefits to a low-grade fever, but some pretty big disadvantages to high-grade fever. Okay, that's the end of this week's lectures. Thank you very much for listening.